Hello, Dr. Maya Ken Ziegler here of Ziegler Chiropractic, and welcome to our workshop tonight where we are diving into uh, understanding how your immune system works and really the things that you can do and what research is showing that you can do now to support yourself during uh, COVID-19. And again, I want to go back to the key word here is resilience. How can you build and create a more resilient system that no matter if you're exposed or infected, um, your body will be able to take care of it and what you can do to support that system if in fact that happens or doesn't, right? We can be proactive. In fact, we love it when we're proactive. Let's start with understanding or, or really getting a refresher on how our immune system works. So we've got two primary arms or divisions of our immune system, the innate response and the adaptive response. Now, let's start with the innate response. Your innate response is the first line of defense, okay? And it is this immediate response that recognizes that there's a weird pattern present, whether it's an allergen, a bacteria, a parasite. Uh, it recognizes that something doesn't belong here. You are not me, right? You are not a part of the body. And so your innate response is made up of natural killer cells, macrophages, white blood cells. And when a pattern is recognized, okay, it triggers the innate cells to fast action response. And understand, these guys are always present. They're always cruising around to assess the environment um, to evaluate who belongs and who doesn't belong. And if you don't belong, we're gonna go after you. So I just want to show you uh, a really cool video here of actual macrophage going after a viral particle or a bacteria within our body. And so um, you can see how he is following around this bacteria and what he's going to do is completely engulf it. Really, it's almost like swallowing it up and taking care of it. Uh, these guys are always around. It is a part of your innate um, response in terms of your immune system. Uh, and, it's, and it's really, really quite amazing. Okay. Now, your adaptive response is different. Your adaptive response is a targeted response. Now, it's waiting for the innate response to trigger and let it know, let the adaptive response know we need you okay we don't need just this general response we need a more targeted refined response um, but it does require activation now your adaptive response is made up of your t cells and your b cells that produce antibodies and understand again this is an intelligent response when we're making and creating antibodies Antibodies recognize specific bacteria, virus, parasite, fungi, and antibodies are created to specifically target those now known um, you know, foreign materials. And so again, an orchestrated intelligent response that leads to memory, leads to um, long-term um, immunity, so to speak. So both are part of the immune system, but this is an orchestrated attack where your immune system recognizes that something doesn't belong and we have this innate and adaptive response. Now, I want you to understand the difference between exposure and the difference between uh, infection. Now, just because you encounter a bacteria or virus, it doesn't classify it as an infection. It's only classified as an infection, infection if it's successful in infiltrating and bypassing your immune response for a certain period of time, causing symptoms and dysfunction in a person. A lot of people can be exposed, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're infected by the virus, bacteria, parasite. Okay, so <clears throat> again, we're hearing a lot about exposures, um, and you know, needing to hold off on you know, coming into the office to get adjusted or needing to quarantine until you know for sure if you're infected. Uh, understanding exposure and, and potential infection is dependent on, number one, the health or strength of your immune system. 
uh, your lifestyle, uh, nutrition, the food you eat to support your body? Uh, are you taking any nutrients to support a healthy immune function? And the amount of viral particles or bacterial particles that you are exposed to or come into contact with, right? Were you at the grocery store and walking by somebody and uh, you know they were infected? Was that your exposure versus more intimate, excuse me, intimate contact uh, where you were in conversation, you know, for 30, 45 minutes with somebody who was in fact, you know, infected. So you've got to look at, you know, number one, what is the health of the individual and the strength of their immune system? And what is their level of exposure to that viral particle? Um, and we'll get into more about infection in, in just a second here. But uh, infection types, there are four major infection types, bacterial, parasitic, fungal, yeast, and viral, which we are going to focus on viral because we were talking about COVID-19. So uh, there's two viral structures. We have non-enveloped, which is over here on this left side, versus enveloped, okay? And coronavirus is actually an enveloped virus. And when it's enveloped, you can see these appendages uh, along the outside of those two viruses. Um, but it indicates that it has a waxy, fatty structure surrounding the virus. And this is part of the virus's infectivity. It needs this to attach to different cells, and it also needs this to protect itself from the environment. Um, and so I also want you to note that viruses are non-living structures, okay? It needs to hijack your own cellular machinery to survive, okay? It needs to get into your cells uh, in order for it to survive. And once it's in your cells, that's when it starts making other viruses. So it makes more children, so to speak, child viruses uh, that can go and infect other cells and perpetuate that cycle. Uh, if it doesn't make it into a cell, it will inactivate over a period of time and eventually die off. So again, we could have viral particles um, that we're exposed to and within the body. And guess what? They are there. It's just if they don't, if they get past your immune system and then get into your cells, that's where we're talking about an infection. Here's a great thing about enveloped viruses is they are sensitive to drying, heating, detergents, and acid. Um, so that means they are really easy to clean on the surface and kill. So that's why they talk about using isopropyl alcohol or peroxide, maybe even bleach. If you're more um, holistically minded, you've got monolaurin wipes. Monolaurin is um, a constituent of coconut uh, or even essential oils. And the three that were highlighted in uh, a study were marjoram, clary sage, and anise oil. So those can actually kill enveloped viruses on the surface. Those can actually kill coronavirus. Okay. So let's jump back to this adaptive response. Um, again, your adaptive response is triggered by your innate response. Okay. So you have this first line of defense. It flags, hey, there's something going on here. It triggers the adaptive response, your T cells and your B cells, which then make antibodies. And antibodies are really a way that your system uh, can flag or highlight that something and be specific about what it's highlighting, that something's present in the body. But understand, it takes time for your body to recognize, number one, what this pathogen, whether it's virus, bacteria, fungi, what it is, and then create an antibody to um, address it. So there is a delayed response, and that's where the antib antibody production contributes to memory of infection. So you've got long-term infection because your body's creating a very specific antibody, a key, so to speak, um, for this specific infection. Uh, what's really cool is that they used to think that, you know, you've got T 
T cells, B cells, and you've got these antibodies and, and your adaptive response is intelligent. But what we're finding now is that there's this cross sensitivity. So if you've been exposed to previous coronaviruses, your T cells seem to have some cross sensitivity to SARS-CoV-2 and more responsive and really a higher level of resiliency within your immune system to um, attack and get rid of it. So again, just another layer of intelligence within this adaptive response, which is really very super cool. The other thing is, you know, the adaptive response is really the anti-inflammatory response. Uh, if you've been plugged in at all about, you know, the coronavirus, they talk about a cytokine storm. And these are proteins that your body makes uh, as it relates to your immune system for appropriate, um, you know, attack of what's available. Uh, when we're talking about your innate response, that's really Again, first line of defense, it's your general response to attack your environment. And it's considered more of an inflammatory or pro-inflammatory response because not only does it attack the pattern that it um, sees, but it also impacts bystand the bystander cells. So it impacts more of a cells, healthy cells, and um, the cells that are not used, so the viral bacterial cells, but it creates a pro-inflammatory response. The adaptive response is anti-inflammatory. And so that means T cells go in and kill viruses in a very controlled, apoptotic way. And apoptotic, I think this is kind of cool, but uh, it's where your immune cells package you know, they break down and package these viral cells in a very specific manner for garbage collection and disposal, which is super cool. So that's what your T cells are doing within this adaptive response, very intelligent response. Um, and that's where when we dive into, you know, when we're seeing a weakened immune system as it relates to coronavirus, uh, we're seeing that a lower T cell or less active T cell um, within the immune system is a big indicator as to uh, how somebody will respond when infected with coronavirus. So T cell function declines with age. We also see it decreased when uh, dealing with chronic diseases. When we look at the worst COVID-19 outcomes, it is uh, elderly and those with or those with comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular disease. And when you have a lower T cell function, again, this is a part of the adaptive response, it worsens a pro-inflammatory response. And what that means is your adaptive response is not, is lowered. What needs to take over? Your innate response. And so that's that pro-inflammatory response. We see the cytokine storm of, you know, the macrophage, the natural uh, killer cells, the white blood cells that, yes, are a part of the immune system, but they impact a bigger part of the body because they're not specific, okay? Um, so let's dive into um, what we're seeing research-wise in terms of uh, how we can support the health of the body if you have coronavirus or you want to uh, increase your resiliency, um, you know, in case you're exposed to it, but that virus doesn't actually get into the cell and cause infection. The biggest one by far, and as I go through this, know that, um, you know, I'm taking a lot of my information from um, a book called The Immunity Fix. Uh, it's by a couple gentlemen who really uh, dove into the research when uh, this pandemic started because they realized that, you know, um, 
addressing what the research is saying, but also more holistic approaches is going to be vital because really this is a conversation that's been left out of mainstream um, media, right? We are, are told to wait for a vaccination, um, not necessarily told to uh, support and create a more healthy, resilient system and how to do that. So their top supplements that they really um, recommend are covered in this presentation, understanding that I also dove into a lot of other research, not just them. So vitamin D is by far the top uh, supplement that is recommended for supporting your health um, as it relates to coronavirus. And just to put into perspective, your coronavirus risk is if you are greater than 60 years old, you're increased, you're, it increases your risk of dying from coronavirus by ninefold. If you're vitamin D deficient, your risk is 15-fold or greater. Okay, so you can't control how old you are, but you can certainly control your vitamin D supplementation or exposure um, support. And so why is vitamin D so important? There are many things. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. First, it activates more than 2,000 genes, including your vitamin K-dependent proteins and repair genes. It helps produce antibacterial and antiviral peptides or proteins. Uh, powerful against breast and prostate cancer, and useful for treating deadly respiratory viruses. And that's pneumonia, bronchitis, and influenza. Uh, it's estimated over 40% of the U.S. population is deficient, okay? And the risk factors increase if you are elderly, you're north of Atlanta, and you have a dark skin color. Now, this conventional consensus um, is that your vitamin D levels within the blood should be around 30. Um, however, vitamin D researchers believe blood levels should be actually around 40, and that would be more ideal and actually create a more resilient system. So if we base off, base our number off of you know, levels of 40 within the blood, and we look at how the US stacks up to that, um, then we're looking at nearly 90% of US would be deficient with vitamin D. And so you can see that supplementing this, especially if you fall into you know, the category of being elderly, living north of Atlanta, which that is us, and if you have a dark skin color, um, you know, certainly should be supplementing with vitamin D. Now, ways to maintain your blood levels, sunshine. So um, the recommendation is 20 minutes, outside, uh, your skin exposed for 20 minutes between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Um, you can get it from food, you got sardines, salmon, beef, uh, liver, egg yolks, cheese, grass-fed butter, and supplementation. Uh, if you've never had your vitamin D levels tested, I would recommend you get them tested. Uh, what is recommended is getting tested every six months to really evaluate where you are and what your proper dosing should be. And if you've actually had your vitamin D levels um, tested and you know what that is, you can use this calculator and actually put in your weight, put in what your goal is as far as blood levels go and what your current level is, and that will give you specific vitamin dosing for that. So vitamin D dosing uh, is around 8,000 IUs per day. Uh, if you have normal body weight or you're underweight, you can reduce that by 1,000 to 2,000 IUs a day. Um, I carry liquid vitamin D in my office. A drop is 1,000 IUs. Um, and so everyone should be on this. Again, we're looking at you know, vitamin D deficiency, increasing your risk by 15-fold or greater. It's a no-brainer. And vitamin D is really reasonable in terms of cost. I think you know, vitamin D that we have is maybe 12, 15, maybe $18, um, and it will last, you know, a good six months. So um, no question, everyone should be in vitamin D. Uh, and magnesium is also important because magnesium is required to convert vitamin D to its active form. And Grassroots Health found that those who do not supplement magnesium, on average, 
you need 146% more vitamin D to achieve the blood level of 40. And so if you take your magnesium, you're going to need less vitamin D because your body's able to use the active form and there's going to be better vitamin D absorption. You can get uh, magnesium through dark green leafy vegetables. If you juice your grains, you can boost your intake. Uh, but the magnesium dosing for optimal vitamin D absorption is between 400 and 500 milligrams a day. Typically, um, where I would start is, you know, take around 200, 250 milligrams a day uh, of magnesium and over a three day period, slowly add in 100 milligrams. You can get up to that four or 500 milligrams per day. You can continue going up more in terms of magnesium, but you really watch your bowels. If your stools start to loosen, that's where you've gotten too much magnesium. So you get back to that previous dosage where your stool stayed pretty solid. Um, low magnesium levels also linked to high blood pressure and diabetes. Why is that important? Because we see uh, with folks who have um, succumb to COVID-19. They have comorbidities in high blood pressure and diabetes. It's, it's kind of the big one. So, um, you know, vitamin D and magnesium, really important in terms of supplements to take to uh, create more resilient system in terms of combating COVID-19. Zinc. So, uh, zinc is a vital mineral, mineral. Your body needs it for over 300 processes. Now, this preserves respiratory epithelium by preventing viral bacterial entry. So, epithelium is the layer of tissue that surrounds your alveolar. And your alveolar are your little buds in your lungs where you have that exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So, that epithelium covers that alveolar and preserves that and prevents viral bacterial entry. Kind of important, especially when we're talking about respiratory disease, uh, the way coronavirus is um, where we get infected is through respiration, right? So if we can support the health of our lungs, the better off we are. It also decreases the replication of viruses. It preserves, preserves antiviral immune function and supports effective function and proliferation of various immune cells, lowering mortality in, in elderly by 27%. Uh, the World Health Organization assumes that at least a third of the world population are deficient. Um, if you are deficient, zinc dosing is between 30 and 50 milligrams per day. Um, I've actually, uh, through standard process, um, you can order a kit to see if you are in fact zinc deficient and if it makes sense that you need to be dosing daily with zinc. However, you can take zinc lo lozenges um, when you first experience cold symptoms. And it's been shown to cut the duration of the common cold by six to seven days if taken correctly, which is pretty significant. We're almost, we're talking a week here. So what's recommended if you're using zinc lozenges is take every two hours within 24 hours of symptom onset. And you take around 18 milligrams per dose, but you want a that daily total dose to be over 75 milligrams. So in order for you to cut that duration of the cold, which is a virus, by six to seven days, you need to be up in that higher dosing um, through your throat lozenges. So make sure you take a picture of that or take note of that. Okay. Uh, selenium is uh, an important mineral. Uh, and again, going back to what is the COVID-19 risk perspective. If you're deficient in selenium, your risk of dying of coronavirus is fivefold, and your risk of poor COVID-19 outcome is threefold. So by that alone, uh, you know, selenium is, is an important mineral. Um, if we are selenium deficient, it can cause a non-virulent RNA virus. So virulent is poisonous, infectious. Uh, non-virulent is, is the opposite of that. So um, if you're a mom or dad, maybe you've had a child who's had hand, foot, mouth syndrome in, in your child, um, but it can turn that non-virulent RNA virus and make it virulent, causing uh, cardiomyopathy. So, causing some heart problems. 
um, selenium deficiency also increases the viral rate of mutation. Viruses mutate, they evolve and create more pathologic strains, making it harder for um, you know, our healthcare system to keep up with treatments to combat these more pathogenic strains, making it challenging or more challenging for our immune system to do its, to do its job. So um, selenium uh, deficiency increases that viral rate of mutation. So daily dosing for selenium is 50 to 100 micrograms. Uh, here's the thing about selenium is that, you know, our foods are just really overall deficient in um, vitamins, minerals, and um, it's becoming, you know, there's record of back in the 30s, uh, Congress recognizing that, you know, our farming practices have depleted the soils. So, I mean, this is something that's happened over long periods of time. So the, the need to um, supplement with selenium and not just getting it from food, but supplementation is, is important. And then melatonin, it's not just for sleep. Melatonin is an anti-inflammatory, anti-oxidative. Uh, it's effective in when they've used it for critical care patients, they found it helps reduce vessel permeability, anxiety, sedation use, and it improves sleep quality. Uh, there's a recent case study, this is 10 patients, so not big, but looking at 10 patients with COVID-19 related pneumonia, they took 36 to 72 milligrams of oral melatonin per day in a four, di four divided doses. Understand this is a really high dosing of melatonin. Usually sleep dosing is between 0.25 and one and a half milligrams. So really high. Uh, and they found that it was associated with 83% reduction in mortality with COVID-19, 30 to 50% reduction in testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. And in the case of these 10 COVID pneumonia patients, it cut the duration of the hospital stay by five days. Uh, and I liked, I mean, I thought this was a pretty profound quote, because of melatonin's potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activities, it would normally reduce the highly pro-inflammatory cytokine storm and neutralize the generated free radicals, thereby preserving cellular integrity and preventing lung damage. Again, that pro-inflammatory cytokine storm as a result of the innate response because we see lower T cell and lower adaptive response. So melatonin can combat that, which is really amazing. Now, I wanna show this study to you because it's not all about supplementing with specific um, minerals or vitamins. It's also about supporting a healthy lifestyle with your nutrition. Uh, this is a study done um, by the uh, Dr. Rath Research Institute, and they used a cocktail of micronutrients to see how uh, it impacted the uh, ACE2 receptor sites, which are the gateway for coronavirus to access human cells within our body. They're looking in the lungs and our kidney. So they wanted to see when we have this micronutrient composition and we um, give different dosing or concentrations of it, how does that impact or actually potentially block those ACE2 receptors so coronavirus doesn't have access to it? But the micronutrient comp position was quercetin. You can see that you know, it comes from apples, honey, raspberries, onions, grapes, cherries, citrus fruits, green leafy vegetables, it's highest in onions. Uh, maybe you've heard of quercetin because it also helps uh, increase absorption of vitamin C. Also cruci cruciferous plant extract, cruciferous plants, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, turmeric root, green tea extract, and uh, resveratrol. So this was their micronutrient composition. And if we take a look at, you know, the viral binding and <clears throat> whether it blocked. Okay, so uh, you see the control and you see the blocking control. Now blocking control had 100% binding. And then you see two and a half micrograms per milliliter, all the way up to 100 micrograms per milliliter in terms of the concentration of micronutrient um, delivered. And they found with higher dosing of that micronutrient um, 
uh, soup, so to speak, or cocktail, uh, nearly 100% blocking of those ACE2 receptor sites, which is pretty profound, right? So this is not just about supplementation. This is about taking a look at the foods that you're eating and choosing nutrient dense foods to support your health and well-being. Um, especially as we look at, you know, we just had Thanksgiving, we're coming into the holidays. Generally, we see lots of sweets, cookies, pies, cakes consumed. Uh, sugar can actually suppress your immune system um, for four to six hours, depending on how much sugar you're, you're taking or you're, you're consuming. And so uh, when you choose nutrient dense foods and vegetables, green leafy vegetables, um, you know, go back here, you know, real food and produce, uh, it impacts your immune system and how your immune system can respond to whatever it's exposed to. But this was specifically, you know, looking at coronavirus. There are so many things that we can cover in this, so many things. Um, and frankly, I've covered probably three or four different uh, topics around boosting immune function. How does your immune system work? How can you support a healthy immune system? I've left so much out. Um, but understand that your lifestyle and what you do on a daily basis is going to make the most impact in supporting a more resilient, adaptable system. And guess what? We go back to that exposure and that infection, right? The difference between those. We are exposed to bacteria, virus, fungi, parasites all the time. And we've got it within us. But our immune system, when it's functioning and healthy, we don't notice any symptoms or dysfunction because, you know, our immune system's taking care of it. It's not getting past it. Uh, so keep that in mind because uh, we really are intelligent beings and uh, when we give our body the proper support, you know, we're talking about a different trajectory. We're talking about different outcomes here. So the last one I want to cover, because I know I'm getting short on my time here, 31 minutes. So I'll make this really quick. Uh, because we're talking about holiday time, holidays can be difficult in general for a lot of people. We think, oh, holidays are a time where we get together with family and friends. There are a lot of people who don't have family, friends, or don't have a community. Um, and in fact, because of COVID times and quarantine, we are told to, you know, put a pause on our holidays. Don't get together. Um, and I just want you to understand that has an impact on our health and our immune function. Uh, the risk of social isolation. Psychologists are studying how to combat loneliness in those most at risk, such as older adults. And they found that the leukocytes, the white blood cells of lonely participants, both humans and rhesus mucks, showed an increased expression of genes involved in inflammation and a decreased expression of genes involved in antiviral responses. So loneliness, it seems, can lead to long-term fight or flight stress signaling, which negatively affects immune system functioning. Simply put, people who feel lonely have less immunity and more inflammation than people who don't. So <clears throat> I bring this up, this is the last piece of the conversation tonight, is how can you engage with your community? And it's really a challenging time right now. Um, and that's where if you start making healthier choices, when it comes to the foods you're eating, when it comes to your choice of supplementation, when it comes to your choice of getting adjusted, showing up to the office and, and getting adjusted and putting your, your brain, your nervous system on point and connecting, making sure your body can and brain can better integrate all the things as it relates to stress. When you're thinking about moving your body or getting outside, when you're thinking about going to bed early, or choosing healthy, supportive behaviors, that's gonna make all the difference. Um, so really, I know this is a challenging time. I am here for you. I am 
I'm happy to be on the phone with you. I'm happy to connect with you in the office. Um, I know things are a little different because I'm on maternity leave. We are taking precautions. We are doing the things to support a clean environment, right? Taking precautions where we're wearing masks, um, we're spatially distancing, um, and we're cleaning the surfaces, uh, but we're also doing the things that support our immune system. And you're doing that too by showing up and getting adjusted. And when you show up and get adjusted, you're showing up for community, you're connecting with people, and that in and of itself can be amazing. There's tons of studies out there about social isolation. I just pulled up one. So I love and appreciate you. Uh, if you have questions, please let me know. I am here to support you in your health journey. Um, coronavirus, I know it's impacted many people. And there have been, uh, I know people who've had family members and friends pass. Uh, I know people who've had coronavirus and um, you know survived. People who've had major symptoms, people who have very little symptoms. And I guess I just go back to how can you support the health of an immune system and that person? That's what you can control. So uh, happy Tuesday. Thanks for showing up. And I look forward to connecting in the future. All right, take care.